Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcasts, where we interview creative thinkers and innovative change makers. I'm Deborah Levine, the editor of the American Diversity Report and your host. And with me today, is someone very special. His name is Andrew Filer. Am I correcting, correct in that pronunciation? Filer, yes. Father. All right. And Andrew is a photographer, author, and fifth generation Jewish Georgian. Andrew has long been active in civic life. He has created numerous community initiatives, serves on multiple not for profit boards, and is an active advisor to political leaders. His art is an extension of his wonderful civic values. Welcome, Andrew. A pleasure. Great to be with you. Thank you. You've been busy. <laughs> I have. <laughs> and one of the things that you do in all of this busyness is about history, in particular, right, a history that is so very important these days, and that is the Rosenwald Schools. Would you like to share with us a little bit about what that is and how you got involved in this historical initiative? So I, uh, I had, I've been a serious photographer most of my life. And about 10 years ago, I started down this path of taking my work more seriously and mercifully being taken more seriously. And as you pointed out at the introduction, I had to figure out what my voice was as a photographer. And I found myself continuously drawn to topics that were, that I was engaged with in my civic life. And my first book uh, was published in 2015. Uh, it's a portrait of an abandoned college, largely abandoned college campus, which uses this dissonance between spaces that we're so familiar with, and yet they're populated by ghosts, not by people, to just to, to bring forward the simple notion that education has been the backbone of the American dream, the on-ramp to the American middle class for all Americans. And I had turned that book in and I was thinking about what I was gonna do next. And I found myself at lunch with a uh, African-American preservationist named Jeannie Syriac. And she's the first person to tell me about Rosenwald schools. And the story shocked me. I'm a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I've been a progressive activist my entire life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? And so I came home and I Googled Rosenwald schools and I found that there, while there were a couple of books on the topic, there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so I set out to do exactly that. And, and so uh, I, over the next three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states, shot 105 of the surviving 500 schools, and the result is, is this book. But let me um, just sort of, for your audience, let me just set the stage and go back to that other part of your question is what to describe what this program was. Julius Rosenwald is born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up in Springfield, Illinois, across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home. And he rises to become the president of Sears, Roebuck and Company. And with innovations like satisfaction guaranteed or your money back, he turns Sears into the world's largest retailer of its era. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his cause is what later becomes known as civil rights. Now, Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, attends Hampton College, becomes an educator, is the founding principal of Tuskegee, then a historically black college in Alabama, originally known as Tuskegee Institute. The two men meet in 1911. And you have to remember, this is before the Great Migration. So 90% of African Americans live in the South, and public schools for African-Americans are mostly shacks with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children. Many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African-Americans. Uh, and, and so the two men uh, developed this friendship. Booker T. Washington invites Julius Rosenwald to go on the board of Tuskegee. He takes the train later that year down to Tuskegee agrees to go on the board, but they, they develop this friendship and they keep talking, what can we do together? And in 1912, they launched the program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. And I'll just briefly describe the structure of the program because that is the genius of this program. 
and they reach out to the black communities of the South. And they say, if you, we want you to be a full partner in your progress. So if you will contribute to a school and we will count as your contribution, cash, land, material, or labor. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we want to be deliberate in creating black white dialogue as a foundation for future progress. And these have to be public schools. While we welcome the school system's contribution, at a minimum, they have to agree to own, maintain, and staff the school, pay for the teachers. You do those two things, Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. And from 1912 to 1937, this program builds 4,978 schools across 15 southern and border states, and the result is transformative. It's an amazing story. And it's, oh my goodness, I wish these people were still alive so we could talk to them today and get their thoughts. This is just amazing. Well, I will say, so I, um, I knew this was an amazing story. Yes. The question was, how do you tell it visually? And I started out uh, traveling across Georgia, traveling across South Carolina and North Carolina. I spent a lot of time on the internet doing research and to try to find the surviving Rosenwald schools. And I started out shooting exteriors one teacher schools, two teacher schools, three teacher schools, these small white clapboard structures. Till the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three-story red brick buildings. It's a fascinating architectural narrative, but I, I realized that the story was incomplete because of the 500 surviving schools, only half of those have been restored. And so there's this critical plea for preservation built into this work because these space spaces are the locus of history and memory in our communities. And when we lose that, we lose something precious. And so I needed to tell the adaptive reuse narrative because that was the path to preservation. Some of these schools have been turned into church halls. Some of them are museums. Some of them are community centers. And to tell that narrative, I had to get inside. And suddenly I needed permission. And in the course of reaching out to get permission, I met all of these extraordinary people, former students, former teachers, local preservationists and historians. And I bring their stories into this body of work uh, with portraiture. And uh, that, was, uh, that was one of the most extraordinary components of this entire journey, meeting all of these people with these rich connections to the story who lived the story. So the voice is basically still alive and going. And Absolutely. That. Absolutely, yes. Wonderful. However, I would add one really so poignant part of this. There's 21 portraits in this, 85 photographs in this book. 21 of them are portraits. Those 20, because some of them are group portraits, there's actually 47 people who appear in this book in, in portrait form. Five of them have since died. Oh. This is a perishable narrative. And so I feel incredibly fortunate that I got to this story in time to still meet some of these former students and former teachers. Um, one of those people who has died is Congressman John Lewis, who is a Rosenwald School alum, who was um, my congressman for 25 years and who wrote this glorious introduction to my book reflecting on his time in an Alabama Rosenwald School and the role that education has played in his life. Wonderful to, to, to hear his voice through his writing in your book. To have had, how did you approach him to write the foreword? What was that conversation like? So I said earlier, the results of this program were transformative and I'll, I'll start at a slightly different place. There are two economists in the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. That gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it's an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come, come through these schools, Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrated Little Rock Central High School and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. 
But the time that I'm shooting this work, which is 2016 into um, through 2019, uh, Congressman Lewis was clearly the most um, prominent graduate of a Rosenwald School. And so I reached out to Congressman Lewis and I, and I said, as I said, I, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I left the South after high school, went bouncing around the world for 15 years. I never thought I would come back to the South, but I have been back in Atlanta now for more than 25 years. And for 25 years, I was a constituent of Congressman Lewis's. And so I reached out to Congressman Lewis to ask if he would do the introduction of the book. And he said to me, I'm not sure I'm comfortable writing the history of Rosenwald schools. I just know I went to school there. <laughs> So I said, Congressman, uh, I will have an essay in this book. There are two prominent African-American preservationists that will have essays in this book. We will have the history covered. What I want you to do is what only you can do. Bring us into that classroom. What was it like to go to school there? What role did education play in your life? And he said, oh, I could do that. And so it was on October 29th of 2019, I found myself in Congressman Lewis's office, sitting at this round table in the middle of his Washington office, working on the introduction to this book. And at the end, um, he stood up and he put on his jacket and there was a cancer awareness ribbon on his bell. Uh, and he said, should I take this ribbon off? And I said, Congressman Lewis, we want, I want the authentic you. And that is the authentic you, leave it on. I took his portrait and it was exactly two months later on December 29th of 2019 that Congressman Lewis went public with his pancreatic cancer diagnosis. And so his contribution of the introduction to this book is one of Congressman Lewis's last public acts. And, you know, I did not set out as part of this journey to have this extraordinary experience. But what an, what an incredible gift to have been able to have this one-on-one -on -one time with Congressman Lewis working on how he helped me tell this extremely important story, um, story in American history. Oh, I wish I'd been a fly on the wall. <laughs> what did he say? Can you give us just a, a few lines of what it was like? Well, um, you know, he... Uh, Here's what I'll say. Um, he ends, he, excuse me, he, he does write in his introduction. He, he sort of, as he's moving toward a conclusion, having talked about the role of education in his life, what it was like to go, what it, what it was like to go to school there, the fact that he had to, um, that he had to walk to school that the school bus with white children would pass them the black children by as they were walking to school. Uh, the fact that there were multiple classes taught within a single classroom by one teacher. Some of those details that just bring uh, to life what an educational experience was in this era. He writes towards the end of his introduction that each of us has a moral obligation a mission and a mandate that when we see something that is not right and not just, we must find a way to get in the way. And so I think in, there is in that comment, the essence of what Congressman Lewis meant when he talked about good trouble. And I think it is a reminder to all of us that we must find our paths to the making of good trouble. Wow. I'm delighted that you were able to do that, that he was still well enough to do that and write that and share it in the book. And it's just an amazing story that you have to tell as well as he had that conversation. Well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll add that there's another link to this story to uh, contemporary politics uh, today. And that is the campaigns of John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock. The relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington is one of the earliest collaborations between blacks and Jews 
and the cause of civil rights. And there is a direct relationship to that impactful program that these two men create and their relationship, not just their working relationship, but their deep friendship. The relationship between Abraham, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel with his white beard flowing, marching arm in arm in the front lines with Dr. King, and who famously says that when he marched with Dr. King, it felt like his feet were praying to what happened in Georgia in, in late 2020 and early 2021, when John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock crisscrossed the state of Georgia together for two months in a runoff, developing not just a political alliance, but clearly a close personal friendship. And Georgia sends its first African-American and its first Jew to the United States Senate. That relationship between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock stands on the shoulders of the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. Wow. Well, history are us. <laughs> My goodness. I don't know what to say. It's just so momentous what you what you're telling us, what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've been able to document with your photos, how amazing this book is and the stories behind it. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do as a follow up to that? Well, let me just comment briefly on, on a couple of things that you just referenced there. Um, the book of this work is uh, a better life for their children. Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America. This book came out in, uh, on May 1st of 2021. Yeah. It was featured in the Wall Street Journal. It was featured in Smithsonian. It was, it's been in a number of other magazines on CBS News, on NPR. Uh, the book is in its third printing, and it is incredibly gratifying as a photographer to have those experiences. But you also referenced the fact that there are stories. In photographic terms, this is a book of photographs. There's 85 photographs in this book. But it is also a book of stories because I came across so many extraordinary stories. Some of them are the stories of the people that I encountered, these former students or former teachers. But I came across Rosenwald schools with direct historical connections to the Trail of Tears to the Tuskegee syphilis study, to okay. the litigation case of Brown v. Board, uh, embezzlement, murder. And I felt compelled to write a short story that goes with each of these photographs, or in some cases, pairs of photographs. And because these, these stories are truly extraordinary. And so I hope folks will, um, will spend time with these photographs. But I hope they'll also read the stories because I think they'll find them inspiring and I think they'll, so they'll be moved and I think they'll come away a little bit more optimistic about the possibility of change in America. I think you're right. I love it. I'm inspired. I, I have for the past about two years run an online Black Jewish dialogue. Mm -hmm. and have it up on the American Diversity Report, because I think this conversation, this relationship is so important for us, not just historically, but as inspiration and to move forward. And I will share this conversation that we're having today with all the people on that dialogue and make sure that they hear about this so they can continue reading about it. Yeah, thank you. I think, look, I think that dialogue is incredibly important because um, I think when we think back about the role that Blacks and Jews have shared in the cause of civil rights, as communities, we have common values and common vision. And, uh, and I think, and I'll tell you, one of the things that I take away from this, from my journey, yes. as both a photographer, and a writer and an activist in my own community, Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington are building schools for African-Americans 
in the segregated South, the Jim Crow South of 1912 America. That is a deeply optimistic act. Yes. That is a multi-generational act. And I think that, that what I find most powerful about this story is this combination of optimism and the long ball. Mm. And I take that inspiration for my own civic work. Congressman Lewis was also fond of saying that we can't, that change will not, um, uh, will not end, will not, you know, will not come magically, uh, that it is the work, not just of a day or week or month, but it's the work of a lifetime. And so I think that that idea of maintaining our optimism and long-term thinking, uh, that's a gift that comes from this story to all of us on the front lines of social change in America. It's a wonderful gift and it is so true. I know that I started uh, marching in civil rights movements back in the mid 1960s and I haven't stopped yet and don't intend to. <laughs> we don't. There is much, much work to be done. Indeed. <laughs> So is there anything else you would like to, to add at this point that we haven't had a chance to talk about? Well, I'll add a couple of things. So first of all, um, if folks are interested in, in purchasing the book, they can buy it from my website. It's andrewfiler.com. Uh, that's F like in Frank, E-I-L-E-R. Uh, there is also a traveling exhibition of this work. It premiered uh, in uh, late 2021 at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights here in Atlanta. Uh, it is uh, now open at the Charlotte Museum of History, where it will be up um, through the middle of the year. And then it will travel to the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, the State of Tennessee Museum in Nashville, the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in New Orleans, the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond uh, and beyond. And uh, folks, the, there's a, a tab on my website called Exhibitions and folks can find the more specific schedule there. Uh, and as new exhibitions come on board, they'll be posted there as well. Oh, wonderful. Oh my goodness. Well, I, I hope that I get to see some of those exhibits. It, it must be a, an amazing experience. And at some point, I hope you and I can meet in person I'll take you out to lunch. <laughs> I, would, I would look forward to that. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. I appreciate all that you do. And audience, I thank you for tuning in. And I know that you're going to enjoy this. So we'll be back. But for now, check out that website. Take care. <laughs>